Welcome to it. You tuned into Current Affairs with Faith Mangope only on 99.2 YFM. Now tonight we have someone very special joining us with an Ivy League education and a cushy job. She chose to sleep on her ex-boyfriend's futon to work on a business idea to help rid the plague of poverty in the developing world. Now that's a sacrifice from my opinion. Your ex's futon from the cogs of a multinational corporation. Ladies and gentlemen, I present to you Leila Jana. Remember, if you'd like to make a comment on any of the issues we touched on this evening, the number to dial is 011-772-0992. Otherwise, simply follow me on Twitter, username Faith Mangope, or Facebook Faith Mangope, or Faith N Mangope. Otherwise, simply log on to yworld.co.za, where you can find out more about the blogs that we've been touching on, and, um, of course, you're able to make a comment on the issues that we're dealing with this evening. Leila, you must know. I have to ask, you left your Manhattan apartment to your ex's futon. You must have been very dedicated and very convinced about your plans. Yeah, he was, he was a good ex also. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I just, I wasn't happy in my, uh, in my corporate job. And I think, uh, yeah, I was working for a fantastic management consulting firm, but really mm -hmm. felt like there was a bigger thing that I was missing out on. And I wasn't spending every day doing, doing uh, you know, executing on my passions. Mm -hmm. Okay. Please tell our listeners about your innovation, Summer Source. Sure. Um, well, I'll, I'll rewind a little bit and take you back to the beginning. Uh, when I was 16, I got a scholarship from a tobacco company and decided I would use it to go and volunteer in Africa. Mm -hmm. I was, at the time, just your typical Los Angeles high school student, so I retired my high heels and went off to live in a village in Ghana for six months and then encountered what I think is the biggest moral tragedy of our time, which is wasted talent. Um, I think I think the worst outcome of poverty is wasted talent, and I think the aid community, which I grew to understand over the next 10 years working in various African development institutions, the aid institution or the aid bureaucracy has really kind of discounted all of the talent on this continent. Mm -hmm. And uh, and so my time in Ghana exposed me to what I saw as tremendous opportunity um, employing young people um, who are coming out of high schools and universities in Africa in droves and just don't have any, any dignified employment. Mm. So, so Samasource was born out of, um, out of my passion for, for development and poverty alleviation and, um, and a coincidence. My very first consulting gig when I was at that corporate job in New York was for a big Indian outsourcing firm in Bombay. Mm -hmm. And I arrived there knowing nothing about outsourcing, but seeing this enormous uh, factory floor, it, well, it looked like a factory floor, of call center agents, just thousands and thousands of people taking calls for American and British travel companies. Mm -hmm. And I remember thinking then, if this can work in urban India, why couldn't it work in Africa? Why couldn't it work where, you know, anywhere where there's internet and there's talent? And, um, and that was kind of the... the seed of Sama Source that was planted then. And over the next two years, I, I learned more about the industry and decided I would form an NGO um, whose mission was to connect people to work through the internet, through these basic outsourcing jobs. So then let's just, let's just get this right now. What we do is that contracts to the, should I say, the developing countries or the poorer states, and then they then will supply that need to the developed nations and therefore get paid. Is that how it works? That's that's pretty much how it works, and it's not just to um, to develop developing nations. Mm -hmm. One of the things I learned being on the ground in Africa is that there are plenty of, of wealthy people in developing nations. So we're targeting our intervention at people who are marginalized within developing countries. Mm -hmm. So so youth in Kenya who are in slum communities would be one example. Or we've been evaluating partners in South Africa that are also in you know in, in the townships. Mm -hmm. So we really want to target um, talented youth who just don't have other economic, um, economic empowerment opportunities. Now, you call the industry that you're in um, a new generation business. The term new generation, what does it refer to? Well, um, all of our work is digital. So, you know, unlike the traditional factories of the last century, mm -hmm. you don't really need a lot of infrastructure to build a digital factory, which is what I call some of our Sama Source centers. So, you know, if you wanted to build a, a, a factory that, that produced um, or, or that processed vegetables and fruits for export, you would need a brick and mortar operation, you'd need trucks, you'd need good roads, you'd need probably grid electricity or some kind of redundant power. Mm -hmm. You need all this infrastructure because you'd be importing, you know, raw materials and and exporting finished goods. You yes. probably also need good relationships with the customs officers. Of course. <laughs> um, the nice thing about our product is that it's digital. So there's no customs officer regulating what goes in and out uh, through the internet. And you know, much has been made of the internet as an information superhighway and of the, the connective kind of tissue that the internet has fostered between nations and between mm -hmm. you know, disparate groups. But what I think is most exciting about the internet is that it's a work superhighway. 
So if you're living in a small village in the middle of nowhere in Ghana, but you can get your, whole, your, your hands on a satellite dish, or maybe you have 3G access because there's a cell phone tower nearby, mm -hmm. and you can get your hands on a basic computing device, we've seen even you know PDAs like the one that I'm holding, like a BlackBerry, um, that are capable of doing the kind of work that we do. Um, all of a sudden, you're connected not just to the world of information, but to the global economy. And that is so exciting. So that's kind of why we consider our work new economy work. Now, Leila, I must ask, is summer source feasible in a developing nation like the pink country like South Africa? Oh, absolutely. So we, we currently have around 800 workers globally in five countries, in mm -hmm. India, Pakistan, Haiti, Kenya, and Uganda. And Kenya is probably our biggest hub. Um, and certainly our biggest hub in Africa. We have around 250 young people working for us in Kenya, uh, in Nairobi, in a rural area, um, in the central part of the country, and in a refugee camp. Mm -hmm. And so if it's possible in Kenya, I absolutely think it's possible in South Africa. I know you have a youth bulge here. You have a, um, y you know, a crop of young people who are merging from secondary and tertiary institutions yes. with no jobs. Yes, and quite a huge problem actually at this particular moment in time, yeah. Exactly. You know, a lot of them speak really good English. A lot of them, you know, are already on Facebook, so they know how to use the internet. And that's mm -hmm. really, that's really all of the basic capability needed to do this kind of work. Now, from what I've gathered, you continuously refer to the term social entrepreneurship. Oh no, you're going to task me with defining that? I love that because you know when I was reading about it and I was looking at it, I thought, I thought to myself, this is a term that we don't always hear of, particularly you know here, particularly as a young person, we hardly hear of the social entrepreneurship. Now, the actual social entrepreneur, what is it? What is social entrepreneurship? Who is the social entrepreneur? Well, I use the terms social entrepreneurship and social business interchangeably. Um, and so I'll focus on social business, which is what I think, you know, is, is a really, is the relevant term for our business. Mm -hmm. A social business, um, as defined by Muhammad Yunus, who's the founder of Grameen Bank and, and kind of the, the grandfather, I think, of this field, a social business is, is one that uh, aims to define itself other than um, you know, in ways other than profit maximization. So um, many people refer to social businesses as triple bottom line businesses. They care about people, planet, and profit.